All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Grief to Growth. And I'm your host, Brian Smith. And today I am very excited to have with us Natalie Sudman. Um, I first heard Natalie on um, Afterlife TV with Bob Olson several years ago. And I read her book, The Application of Impossible Things. I think this was the fourth time I read it. I read it preparing for this interview. Uh, Natalie was on a mission in Iraq in 2007 when her vehicle is hit by an improvised explosive device or an IED. And I think it's fair to say Natalie was killed. Um, she was at least severely injured, but we'll talk about why I'd say she was killed because she had one of the most incredible near-death experiences that I've heard that she wrote about in her book, The Application of Impossible Things. And that book came out in 2012. So as I said, I've read it like three or four times because it's one of the most, and I've read lots of near-death experience books. It's one of the, probably the densest, I think. Like I was trying to highlight it and I ended up highlighting the whole book. There's just <laughs> so much really great stuff in there. So what I'm going to ask Natalie to do today is take us through the experiences she had and the different environments that she visited while she was having a near-death experience and how those things actually apply to our lives today. Because I like the fact that you titled it, The Application of Impossible Things. So with that, I want to introduce Natalie Sudman. Hi. Thanks, Brian. So Natalie, if you could just kind of take us through the experience that you had, what was going on, uh, the time you had the experience, and just kind of tell us about that. Sure. Um, I was working in Iraq as a civilian employee of the Corps of Engineers, the Army, and um, I was administering construction contracts for the reconstruction effort. And... Um, this day we were going out to visit some uh, some construction sites and it was a long day there was four vehicles and an iraqi police escort and at the end of the day it was at the end of the day we we're going back to base and i was tired so i was kind of sitting like this with my elbow on the door and my eyes closed and I so I was there in the truck and then I was suddenly not there in the truck. I was standing in front of um, the way I describe, I call it the gathering. It's like thousands of beings all around me like a stadium and I was downloading information to them. And um, I knew exactly what I was doing. I didn't feel like, where, where am I? You know, there was none of that. I, I just, I knew where I was, I knew what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. When I finished downloading that information, I, um, I told them that I wasn't gonna go back. I didn't have any interest in going back to the physical world. Mm -hmm. and, and there was, I say there was, they all agreed to that, but I mean, they were kind of in no position to agree or not. They accepted that. Okay. They, there was no authority over me and I had no authority over anyone else. We were all just doing what we do and um, cooperating with each other. Okay. So, so they accepted that. And then they, they were like, well, what if you did this? They kind of asked if I might be interested in doing some other stuff and going back. That, mm -hmm. that some skills that I had would be helpful right now. And, and I, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now I go, really? It was that easy? <laughs> But, yeah. <laughs> so this environment you called the blink environment in the book, and this was yeah. a physical environment because you said coming back to the physical. So how was how were you when you were in this environment? Well, I appeared to myself as as I was in the truck. So I was in my BDUs, my my camo mm -hmm. um, army gear. I was kind of tattered up and from the explosion, but I was, my physical form was whole. Okay. And I didn't think, oh, I've just been blown up or something. Mm -hmm. um, and these beings had form, but it, it was like they could, they could change form. I, I think I was, it was kind of like a cooperative form. It was easier for me to perceive them in form maybe because okay. I come from the physical, but I could, when I go back to this environment, I can, I can revisit it and I can interact with these beings and I can perceive them in different ways. I can turn them into a monster or I can turn them into um, an animal or something. Mm -hmm. I can perceive them in that way. So I think the form is not important. 
necessarily the the um, being each of them is a consciousness a being a personality they certainly each have personalities okay so when you say you go back to this environment you don't mean that you're recalling the environment you actually can still go back to it I can do both. Um, I can go back into that experience mm -hmm. and kind of re-experience it and slow it down in a sense mm -hmm. so that I can kind of pick it apart. But I've also gone back to that environment and interacted with them. And um, sometimes it feels so <laughs> unreal <laughs> because now I'm anchored more in this right. physical um, mind so it while it feels more real as soon as i come back into the, my physical mind it's like that that feels like a dream and yet a really really you know one of those lucid dreams that's just so clear yeah um, yeah so when you were there and you're downloading this information so it sounds like it was kind of like your time on earth was like a mission is that would you would that be fair to say well, I don't know, a mission, um, you know, that's kind of a human idea of mm -hmm. giving us a goal or something. And um, goals often come with deadlines and there's all these, um, there's a lot of connotations that go with that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's more like I agreed to do some explorations. I agreed to help out with some things and um, and it, it's not like I have to. I mean, it, the right. feeling is like I can change my mind anytime. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do this. Um, it's more like it's interesting to me and it's, it's of value to some other beings. So um, it's fun to do. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's an agreement that you, that you made. You're, you're doing yeah. the exploration, you're doing it because it's interesting. So you, you're getting mm -hmm. something out of it, but you're also benefiting a Other. greater uh, group of beings. Right. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's a good way to say it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, I, I you have trouble, to... you know, a lot of people talk a lot about contracts. You know, we come into this lifetime with a contract. Right. And you go, ah! <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's, that's so, um, it's so authoritarian and it's so, um, it's so, goal oriented and it sounds like it's got a schedule and I just don't perceive it that way. Yeah. It's much more free flowing and it's much more voluntary yeah. and it's much more fun. <laughs> than that. I, w I want to get into that. I want you to finish telling you the, uh, the experience you had and then I want, cause I have a lot of questions for you about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you mentioned that I call this the blink environment and, mm -hmm. um, in my book. So I told them I didn't want to come back. They suggested, Oh yeah, you know, maybe you'd like to do this. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I blinked to another place that I call the deep rest environment. Mm -hmm. And here I felt, I feel like I did not have any, I did not have form, but I had organization. It felt like the way I describe it is I was an organization of energy. And there were two other beings there who felt sort of like, mechanics like they were just tinkering and tuning up that organization of my energy I was we didn't interact we didn't talk to each other or anything I felt like they were just doing their job and I was relaxing mm -hmm. and um, and at this is a point where I would say I did something like what others describe as a life review mm -hmm. but for me it wasn't there wasn't any judgment involved really, or the judgment was pretty, it was all from me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and maybe I was just really easy on myself, <laughs> but, um, it was kind of like real casually kind of paging through my life. Okay. Going, oh, what worked? What didn't work? Um, what might be, what it, what implies that there's more to explore here or there? Um, I was looking for things that were fun. <laughs> I was looking for things that were, um, had unexpected outcomes. Like I'm, I'm an artist and I like kind of playing with creativity. Like you start to do something without knowing where you're going and hmm. see where it goes. And that's kind of the same idea that I was using to evaluate 
some of my life. So anyway, I kind of, I, I completed that, got a good rest there, and then blinked back to the, um, the big gathering where mm -hmm. I felt like we talked about kind of in more detail what I was going to do. And then I blinked again and I was, uh, I was hovering. It was like I could see the scene of the truck, the, the blown up truck below me. And it was, I felt like I was, let's say I was at a 45 degree angle kind of looking down on this scene. Mm -hmm. And I could see the truck and I could see the four of us in the truck. Um, but I could also see all of this as an organization of energy. I could see the energy itself. Uh, I was with two other beings, one of whom was like an old friend of mine. And the other one felt like an observer or maybe learning from us. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what we were doing here is um, I was choosing my injuries. So I kind of do the equivalent of waving my hand and I would set some injuries in my body. I would, um, I would cut off my hand and um, put a big hole in my head. And, and as soon as I did that, we could see the whole kind of trajectory of the life I would lead with those injuries. Mm -hmm. And we, from that perspective, it was hilarious to us. We were laughing. It was like, oh, you know, look at her trying to write with her left hand. That's hilarious. <laughs> you know, from that perspective, it was very funny. Of course, once we're back in the body, it's not that funny. You know, it can right. be very, very difficult. But when you don't have any fear and when you are, um, when you have a different perspective, you're going to have a different emotional reaction to it. Exactly. So yeah. From that point of view, we thought it was hilarious. So we were trying different things, trying different things. Finally, I'm like, okay, we got to just, <laughs> I got to just pick them. And I just set the injuries that I felt would help me do the things that I had agreed to do. And then I immediately blinked again and I was down next to the truck and I was with about eight beings eight other beings and we were discussing the things that I had agreed to do but we were discussing them from kind of more of an on the ground level you know like things look one way when you talk about them with a manager <laughs> yeah. and then when you get down on the ground you got different things that you have to deal with so that's kind of the level we were talking about things there mm -hmm. and and I say that we're standing next to the truck but everything felt sort of um, ethereal. Everything had form, but it didn't necessarily have weight. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. kind of twilight zone-ish. Um, so then, yeah, as soon as I, um, as soon as we were finished there, then I just popped back into my body. And I became conscious um, hearing an audible pop. And I, 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 I knew that I had been somewhere else, but I also knew that this wasn't the time to think about that or remember that, that I knew immediately that we had been blown up. Mm -hmm. I knew that it was not just a few scratches all around, which happens. Um, and so I really was, um, I stayed in the present in order to sort of deal with the present, you know, so. Um, yeah, woke up, opened my eyes in that truck. Yeah, with with the injuries that you had chosen. And I remember the first time I heard you say that in an interview, and then I, I read it in the book, and I'm like, this isn't funny. You know, you, <laughs> you chose some pretty serious injuries. But, um, you know, I think that's, it's really, there's there's so much interesting about the book, but that was one of the things I think is, it's really, because you talked about soul contracts, and we kind of touched on that a little bit, and soul planning, and so there is this level of, you know, the first, I guess, kind of perception a lot of people have is God is in control of everything. And God is the one that makes us have this, we're basically like puppets and he just throws things at us. Right. So that's the one level. And then there's kind of the soul contract level where we agree to do this, but it's kind of like, we have to do it. And people, 
And they first hear about, you know, for example, reincarnation. Well, do I have to go back and do I have to do this? And the way you describe it, it sounds a lot more interactive. It's a lot more that we're involved in, in the planning. And, and as you say, you, you can, so even as you're going through these things now, you, you approach with a different approach because you know that you chose it, at least on some level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My, in my whole experience, there was never anything or anyone dictating anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, it was very clear to me that we are the agents. We are the authorities in our own experiences and our own lives. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we as personalities, you know, with able to see this much are in charge necessarily, but we're, we're whole beings. Let's say that this personality is an aspect of who I, who and what I really am. And yeah. what I really am is an aspect or um, an expression of God or of source or of universe or, you know, whatever word you want to use for that, all mm -hmm. that is, that infinite um, creative force. And because we, we are an aspect of it or an expression of it, we're, we're actually much, much bigger than we think we are. Yeah. And we know ourselves as in this personality. We have a lot more agency and a lot more power in our lives than we think we do. And, um, and so, yeah, in my experience, we co-create with our whole selves. We get in the flow of that creative infinity and, um, and we, we exercise both our, the will of our personality, but also work with the will of our whole self if we're, certainly if we're willing to. I mean, I think that if we can come into that kind of coherence, um, whether that's through meditation or through um, creativity or um, through reflection, that mm -hmm. we actually are going to have an easier time no matter what we're experiencing in life. Because we're not fighting ourselves. We're not fighting whatever it is we're experiencing. If we say, well, this is my experience. It's not in the way of life. This is my life. Right. So I'm going to pay attention to this. And even if it's unpleasant, even if it's difficult, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to walk through it with some gratitude, at least willingness to be, gra to be grateful for it, even though it may feel impossible. Right. Well, you know, and it's interesting because I'm just, I just got into this idea of the whole self in the last four or five years when I started really getting into this after my daughter you know, passed away. And so my thought at first was, well, it's our higher selves that controls what happens, right? Because it's, it's got a higher perspective. So we as the physical mind or the, the, the personality, we're just kind of maybe even puppets to the higher self. But from what you're saying, it sounds like we're still co-creating with the higher self. Is that, is that right? That's my understanding. I think that the, sometimes the whole self does choose things that we as personalities would say, I would never choose this. I'm not in control of this, you know, right. as a personality, you wouldn't choose to lose your daughter, you know, right. Right. but as a higher self, you're right. As a higher self, that part of ourselves has a different perspective, mm -hmm. has a broader perspective. It's like saying the way I describe it a lot of times is like that three-year-old wants 10 cookies. Give me yeah. 10. Cookies. I'm going to die without 10 cookies. I have to have 10 cookies. And you're like, you're not having 10 cookies and it's kind of hilarious, right? Yeah. But it's not hilarious to that three-year-old. They're serious. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, th I, I love that analogy. And it's, I've used it, kind of the same analogy, not the 10 cookies, but we, from our perspective, you know, we, we, we don't know exactly what's good for us sometimes. Okay. And we think, no, no, I want this, I want this. And we don't know what would happen if we got that. And we mm -hmm. don't know what greater things we might have, and have happen to us by maybe not having that in this experience. Yeah. So the challenge of being the hu a human is to be able to try to get that higher perspective while you're still human. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we do have free will. So I think that there are some things that our, high, that our higher self chooses that we're gonna experience. But how we experience that, that's up to us. And, um, you know, I, I do think that um, we can we can kind of drag ourselves off our path a little bit if we, uh, it, especially out of fear, you know, if we as personalities let fear kind of run the show instead of 
allowing ourselves to trust the flow of the universe and the higher self. I think, um, I think we can sometimes make things more miserable for ourselves than they have to be. Yeah. You know, the thing about your book, I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I keep, I think it's a fantastic book. Um, but the thing is, one, I was reading one of the reviews on Amazon today and the guy said it was hard to read, which it is because there's some pretty difficult concepts in there. Uh, or maybe, maybe, yeah, kind of difficult, I guess. And he said there wasn't a lot of emotion in it. But I, one of the things I got out of your book is that we take life way too seriously. And mm -hmm. one of the things I love about your personality is you're just kind of like, yeah, let me just try this. Let me try that. And it's, and it's not that big of a deal if we, quote, mess up, you know, because it's right. all about the experience. Yeah, our culture is really into um, – winning and doing things right mm -hmm. and you know we don't even know how to deal with the world word failure or you know we don't we don't use the word exploration very much which has right. no end and it has no tests and it um it's not a goal oriented thing um but i think we could use more of that in this culture um living doesn't have to be um, one test after another, you know, whether it's us testing and judging ourselves or other people testing and judging us, mm -hmm. it doesn't be that way. It can be much more gentle and a lot more fun. Yeah, a lot more fun. Well, you know, it's interesting because as I've gotten, as I've kind of evolved out of fundamental Christianity into whatever I, I got into next, there's still, I, I'm, now the people I'm dealing with are like, What's my purpose? What's my sole purpose? You know, am I gonna am I gonna accomplish my purpose? What I came here to do? Um, and again, I think that's one of the lessons I got from your book was like, it's not about accomplishing something; it's about exploring and and just you know and enjoying the ride and trying to learn from whatever experiences come. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. It's more about being. You know how? I get that question a lot. What's What's your, what's your purpose? How come you didn't tell us in your book? What's your purpose? Well, first of all, it's my purpose. <laughs> so right. you don't need it. Um, but then too, I think that it's real easy to, um, to think that we're all sort of given an assignment mm -hmm. and, and we want that assignment to make self make sense to our human mind. So I'm here to learn about the balance of power or I'm here to learn about um, relationships or loss or how to negotiate grief or things like that. Mm -hmm. what, if your, what if your purpose is to exercise curiosity? Yeah. You know, and the human mind goes, well, that's not. That's, that's not purpose. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I think um, we could rethink some of that purpose. I, yeah, yeah. And you, I, I'm looking at the, the questions I had to ask you. We kind of already touched on soul planning and soul contracts and stuff like that. And I, th I like what you said about that. And I, like I said, I think people sometimes go from one dogma into another one. And I, and I mm -hmm. see people falling into that. Like, am I going to, am I going to meet my contract? And I, I don't want to get sent back. You know, I, that's yeah. another fear that a lot of people have. It's like, if I, if I don't learn the lessons I'm supposed to learn, then they're going to send me back. Right. Well, you'll choose. Yeah. And in my, as far as I know, you'll just choose to come back. You'll right. be like, well, I didn't get as far as I wanted to go. I think I do want to keep exploring that. I'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one's, as far as I know, from my experience, no one's going to be like throwing you back in the lion's den. It's your choice and yeah. you can do it. You might be surprised. You might not be having very much fun in this lifetime, in this personality, in this body. Mm -hmm. And you may get out of it, leave this body, sort of return to that whole self perspective and go, wow, that was so fun. Yeah. I'm going right back in <laughs> to yeah. do that again. You know, we, you don't know. It's like immersing yourself in, let's say, a game of monopoly or something mm -hmm. and um and you're in it and you're losing you're going ah, i hate this game i hate this game and uh and then you get done with the game and you go that was really fun we should play again even though you lost right yeah it's exactly not about winning it's not about like setting it having having your whole life be a charmed um 
lovely thing. You know, sometimes the challenges are way more fun in the end than yeah. the sweet. You know, there's a, sure it's nice to have sweetness, but those challenges are gripping. <laughs> yeah, it's like my my daughter and I love to play video games, and we played Super Mario Brothers. And so, when you're playing a game, when you're when, even when you're designing a game. If you could just go through and win every level with no, you never lose a life, you never, you never have a challenge, that's not a fun game. Nobody right. will play that game, right? right? But we also don't want to play impossible games. There's, there's, right. there's got to be a certain level of challenge so that when you overcome it, it provides a sense of satisfaction. Yeah. So when I think about Shayna, I think about like when we used to play Mario Brothers and like you get to those tough levels and you go over it over and over again and finally you break through it. And that was the fun. That was the fun yeah. of saying, yeah, it, it took me 10 times to get through that level, but I finally got through it. Yeah. And when you get through it, that moment is so like, when you just get it, Yeah, it's like a magical moment, right? Yeah, it is. It's an, and it's a moment you would never have without the struggle. Right. Yeah. So in, in the book, you, you talked about the power of thoughts, which I thought I think is interesting also. And you talked about the way you describe thoughts, I thought was interesting, like they almost have their own energy and they have an ability to, to create. Could you expand on that? Yeah, um, we live in a creative, well, we, we exist as creative beings mm -hmm. and in, a, in an energetic universe. You know, we think of these things as solid, as the wall behind me is solid, but all it is is an organization of energy. And because of my organization of energy, I can't put my through it um, but how is energy organized how does it get organized it gets organized by intention by thought by imagination so if we imagine something if we begin to think something then uh, then it actually begins to move energy it begins to shape the energy into whatever you're thinking or or imagining and and that, I mean, there are sort of uh, manifested ways that we can watch that too, because it's not only uh, actually moving energy, but it's also now I begin to make different kinds of choices. And now I begin to um, choose diff uh, make different kinds of actions because I'm imagining that thing and I'm believing in that thing. Mm -hmm. So um, if we, if, if we change our thoughts and change our beliefs, then we're going to change our experience. So as an example, someone who says they want to be rich, but they believe that rich people are mean, rich people are greedy, um, rich people have no morals, um, then they're not going to let themselves get rich because those thoughts, then they would be that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you change your thoughts, if you kind of clean up your thoughts and say, well, um, I would like to be rich and I would like to be um, trustworthy. I would like to have integrity, uh, you know, have all these things. I believe that this is what I'm going to imagine. This is what I'm going to think. This is what I'm going to put out into the universe. Mm -hmm. Then you're not only shaping, actually shaping tr real energy you're also beginning to, uh, to direct the way you act in a different way and the way you uh, make decisions in a different way. Yeah, I love that you touched on that because uh, in the book you call it contraries and you, and you gave yeah. that, that very example and I, I just, it resonated so much with me because um, I think for me, it's not that I believe that rich people are, are greedy or evil or selfish. It's just, I kind of have this feeling that life is always gonna financially be kind of a struggle. Mm -hmm. I think is, is the, the belief that I, I think is an underlying belief. I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I, how do I overcome that? Um, how do I begin? Yeah, to how do I, how do I acknowledge or how do I make real that the universe is infinite? Abundance. Right. Yeah. Right. Instead of, Oh, if I get something that someone else will have less or there's just never quite enough. You have to work really hard for what you get. Yeah. Um, I have to deserve what I get. You know, we have a lot of beliefs around things like that when really the universe is infinite. Mm -hmm. Infinity is infinite. It's really hard to think about infinity, but that yeah. means that abundance is infinite. 
Yeah. If we, if we, um, if we stop making decisions out of fear and make them out of abundance and love, what happens? Um, it, it can be kind of amazing what happens. Yeah, but it, it's, it's it can the, take a long time to undo that stuff too. You know? Yeah, I think that's a good. I think I like that word undo because I think we come into this world believing that things are infinite, but then we get we get taught by at least our society, our culture, yeah. that it's it's all competitive, it's all a matter of struggle. This this work ethic that they that we've been given, mm -hmm. and I think we self sabotage um, yeah. because we're we're taught that we're small and you know so. For some of us, it's, a, it's overcoming a lifetime of programming to get right. back to where we came from. Yeah, and that's what I call it too, cultural programming. You know, ever from like the first day we're born, <laughs> they're starting to teach us, to inculcate us with the culture. And yes. that's okay. I mean, we came here to do that. We mm -hmm. chose this time and this place. So let's participate. But then, you know, we, when we get to a certain place in our in our awareness growth or whatever you want to call it then yeah then we have to start unlearning things in order to kind of remember who and what we really are and what we're really capable of yeah and i guess that's the game we play right we come here yeah. and we, we choose to forget so that we can try to remember <laughs> yeah uh, another thing you touched on i thought that was really interesting uh was the whole idea of good and evil um, you know, and I think especially right now as, as divided as we are in, in our, in our culture and half of us looking at the other half is, and saying they're evil. Um, I liked how you talked about, you know, good and evil are, we have a different perspective once we get out of this environment for one thing. And I think you even mentioned something about people maybe possibly playing a role, you know, so we're, we're here. So we might, we might judge someone as doing something that we feel is really evil, but maybe that's something that they, you know, chose to do. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm wary about talking about it because I had to choose my words so carefully in the book. You know, mm -hmm. I, don't want, I don't want it misunderstood that I'm condoning bad behavior, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, um, but from, from the whole self perspective, there is no good and evil. There is no good or bad. Everything just is. Everything is an experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is, it is possible that someone comes to play a difficult role for us in order, to, uh, in order for us to be able to play the integrity role or whatever. You know? um, we don't know what, what other whole beings are choosing to do. Right. That doesn't mean that we can't exercise discernment here from the physical world and from the personality. It doesn't mean we don't choose what's acceptable and unacceptable behavior um, in, in relation to the communities that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that there isn't, there isn't um, action. Okay. There is action that is in alignment with the very basis of being, which is love. Mm -hmm. And there's um, behavior that is, it doesn't appear to be coherent with love. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so given a choice, which would we choose to do? You know, if we are in our whole selves and we are in alignment with ourselves, we're going to choose the love. Mm -hmm we're going to choose the action of love that treats other people as we want to be treated um, and that kind of thing. But if someone is, is acting out of that alignment or we perceive that they're acting outside of the alignment of love, what, it, what this means is you don't condemn the being, you don't condemn the person. Mm -hmm. you, you, may, you may condemn that action that behavior. Right. Um, I often use the, um, the example of Martin Luther King Jr. He, he stood up for what he believed and what he thought was right. He aligned himself with love, but he did not attack and denigrate the people who, who, 
who he was saying, don't do this. You know, the people right. who right. were who were attacking his people, the people who were killing, um, hurting um, his, he, his community, he didn't attack them back. He didn't hurt them back. He said, we're all humans. Right. Stand up to your own humanity. Right. That's right. what he said. That's where the power is. When we stand up and recognize the other being as whole and invite them to lift their behavior back into love. Yeah, I th I think you did an excellent job of explaining. I understand why you why you kind of shy away from it because it's one of those concepts, and that's why I would say the book. This is like an intermediate to advanced book, right? <laughs> because this is this is a this is an intermediate to advanced concept to mm -hmm. say that something can be wrong on one level but not wrong on another level. So yeah. in this world, we do have rules and we do have norm behavioral norms and we do have consequences for actions that we take. And we do have actions that are not as loving as other actions. Now, from a higher level, that may be different, but we're not living at that level right now. So it's like, yeah. if, like we go back to our game analogy. If you're playing a game, there are rules. In, in basketball, you can't travel. You right. know, it, you can carry a basketball. It's, it's fine to carry a basketball and walk across the street, but right. not if you're playing a game of basketball. Right. So, yeah, they agree to play the game. Right. Yeah. So when we play here, we play by the rules. But as what I try to do, um, as we're going through the, again, with the turmoil we're going through right now is mm -hmm. to separate that, look at that person as a whole individual, as, right. as, a, as a perfect being on some level, mm -hmm. but maybe not right now. Right. And, and, I, and, and so what they're doing right now, I can, I can hate their behavior. I can say yeah. that's wrong, that that's, that's evil mm -hmm. according to the rules of this world. Right. But on another level, maybe, maybe they're an old buddy. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when honestly, energetically, when you recognize them, when you make that effort and recognize, I see you as a whole being, I don't like your behavior. I don't like your personality, mm -hmm. but I see you as a whole being. You really, whether you know it or not, you're inviting them. You're making that visible to them. You're making that available to them. Mm -hmm. So you really have just given them a healing when you do that. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important that we that we try try to do that, you know, and and that's something that I that I make an effort to do. Um, yeah, and, but it's, it's really it, hard to do sometimes now with the way things are. But I think it's important. It is, it is, and that's the only way I think we can we can heal because the you know the way we're going right now, just pointing fingers at each other and, and assuming right. that people have bad motives. And I also don't believe people have bad motives. I think I think people do what they think is best at the yeah. time that they're doing it. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, since your experience, it's been, uh, what, what was it, 2007, it's been, it's been several years now. Two years. Um, so you, you chose this, this life with some of the physical difficulties and you, the beings, I guess, kind of agreed to kind of stay with you as you were going through it. So how's that worked out? Uh, you froze. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's, I love doing the video things, but sometimes the bandwidth gets choked and it freezes. Yeah. So I was gonna, what I was asking you is, um, so you, you agreed to come back, you agreed to have a certain number of injuries, challenges. Uh, I think the beings kind of agreed to maybe be a little more close to you and kind of guide you as you're going through this with the new challenges. So how has that worked out? Um, I guess that um, I would like it if, I had that expanded awareness all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I kind of don't, you know, because I'm in a human world and kind of the longer you stay here, the more you participate again, you mm -hmm. know, and kind of come back into this world. And although I think it's that expanded awareness is much easier for me to move in and out of and, um, and I use it a lot more than I did before, which is great. I like that a lot. Um, there are still sometimes, just like anybody, when I'm like, "Help me, help me," <laughs> and, and I get what I what it feels like nothing back. <laughs> right, right. And, but now I also know, okay, this is mine to do. This, you know, I don't. Apparently, I don't need any help. <laughs> yeah. I can figure it out on my own. Um, 
I think that, I mean, I think that in many ways, my experience has informed me. Um, you know, I just gave that one example, but, um, you know, when things, I still get challenges in my life. And when things are challenging, I remind myself, I chose this, you know, in the end, it is, it's going to be all right. It's, yeah. We all get up off the stage and walk away. <laughs> right. <laughs> no one's really killed in the play. And, you know, the, the hurts that feel really, truly um, tragic and horrific here, um, even those don't last. Even yeah. those are lifted, you know. So when things get difficult, I think um, that that experience certainly made some of those times easier for me. Yeah. Well, the sense of humor that you mentioned, I mean, I, I'm willing to laugh at just about anything and that's just been exaggerated after this experience. Yeah. And that's, that's what I, I've seen you do a couple of interviews and I, and I, I, and even in your book, I love the humor that comes through and, and it reminds me to, you know, not take things so seriously. And uh, I think you use the analogy in the book, like being in a movie, you know, we get all caught up into the movie. And, I, and I, I love that analogy. We get all caught up and we're crying with the characters and even more like actually acting in a play. I think I, you just mentioned that it's, it's more like that. We forget that we're playing a role. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we all are going to walk out of the theater. You know, the sun's still shining. You know, it's yeah. dark in the movie theater, but the sun's still shining outside yeah. and it's, it's going to be OK. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times us people that haven't had these experience though we see someone that's had it and we go oh they're they're really lucky because you know they had that experience and they they really get to know and i i do i do talk to a lot of people who had near-death experiences and i have a little bit of jealousy about it but i know it comes with its own set of challenges yeah it really does i i can't tell how many times people have said that i want an nde without the nd part <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but yeah it does come with its own challenges i mean um it was very disorienting for quite a while because I was perceiving in a very different way from anybody else. You sure. know, people would say, how are you? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to say to that because whatever I, if, if I'm honest, my answer would make no sense to you. You right. know, right. <laughs> I'm coming from somewhere totally different. And, um, and I think too, I mean, I can I can delineate a lot of these concepts in the book and I can talk about them and they're, and they're real to me that that doesn't mean I'm not still a student of them. Right. That doesn't mean that I just know them and I'm just cruising through my life. You know, I often have to remind myself of them and convince myself of them Yeah, <laughs> just like anybody else. Yeah. So um, I, I don't necessarily think that having an NDE it makes me any wiser than anybody else. I, it doesn't, I still, I still have to live my life. We all still have to live our lives. So all of you people who might be a little bit jealous, I'm here to tell you there's nothing to be jealous of. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was, I was talking to someone this morning that uh, is a very high vibrating person connected to spirit, you know, and, and, you know, but it presents a set of challenges because living in this world which you know i put people call low vibration or maybe slower might be a better way of putting it a, a denser vibration mm -hmm. uh when you're when you're vibrating faster it's a mismatch so yeah. you don't you don't fit in and you know and i'm i'm somewhere in between i think but there's so many things in this world i think are just they're crazy i mean from the time i was a little kid they just don't make any sense like yeah. why do we go to war why do we blow it why do we have events where we try to kill as many of the other people as possible and i think if, sense, right? if aliens were looking at our planet they'd be like what are what are they doing right <laughs> why are they creating weapons that can literally destroy the entire place yeah yeah i think a lot of people a lot of us feel that way and and feel like we're kind of walking around in a very even though it's the culture we grew up in we look at it and go this makes no sense at all. Yeah. yeah. So um, it is, yeah, it's a challenge. It's nice to find other people, you know, who are, who perceive like we do, just at least to have discussions like this. And Well, you know, it's, a lot of people are saying that the, that the vibration of the planet is, is speeding up, raising, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
I don't know if that's true or for finding each other or, or what it is, but I hope it is. I hope it's true. Um, and I hear people say the veil is getting thinner. So um, but then again, sometimes you look around, and you're like, you know, really, are we, are we evolving or not? Yeah, what I keep being given is that it's the organization of energy that holds this reality in the shape that it's in is shifting, mm. allowing for a new, new potentials of experience. Mm. And that will, um, yeah, in a sense, speedy, I would say the, the density is lessening and speeding up. Yes. Speeding up. Okay. Mm. Um, and, um, when that happens, the, the, the dysfunctional things that have been hidden in the closet and, um, and stuffed away in the drawers, those things have to come out and get cleaned out. Yeah. So the closet doors are open now. <laughs> yeah. And we're finding, you know, all this stuff is, you, you can't hide it anymore. Right. And so it's going to have to, it has to be cleaned up. And, and, and it, 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 when I'm, when I'm shown this, it does get cleaned up. I'm like, how <laughs> could this possibly get cleaned up? And yet I'm shown, I keep hearing it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Um, that, that this is a necessary, just kind of mechanically necessary um, phase to, okay. that it goes through and that once it we make that switch um when we when kind of finally go over that tipping point mm -hmm. that we are gonna people are gonna come into this world with a lot more awareness we're not gonna blind ourselves so much the way we have in the past we're mm -hmm. gonna have kind of a different set of experiences available here where we still have form, we still have body, but we also bring in a lot more memory of who and what we really are. Wow. And well, I hope that's true. It sounds good to me. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I love yeah. hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, are there, uh, you know, like I said, your book, and I want to talk about the book again, The Application of Impossible Things. I want to encourage anybody that's listening to get the book. If you think we've covered the book, we haven't, not even close. I knew we, I knew we wouldn't be able to. There's just, there's so much in there. Um, but I get the feeling there's a lot more about you. You don't talk much biographically in the book about yourself. And I know you've got some abilities in terms of still being able to see to the other side and communicating with other beings. So are there any more books in your future? I hope so. Um, I've got a couple, two or three books that I'd like to write and I keep putting them off. <laughs> okay. I just keep, yeah, other things come up and, um, my longtime boyfriend and I, he just retired and he had lived in Maryland and I had lived in Arizona. So last year we sold the, uh, both our houses and have moved to Minnesota where I grew up, mm -hmm. where I have some family and, and we're trying to get, I mean, that's, that's going to take another year. I think we get all that straightened out. So I keep, yeah, it, the books are in, they're up here. They just yeah. need to get well, I want to encourage you to get them out because I, I, like I said, I've, I've read so many of these types, or not these type, but near-death experience books, afterlife communications books, um, and I like the lessons in yours are just they're so incredible. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it's a small book. I, you you got to read it three or four times to pick to really get it. And I, I read it first, um, I think it was like two or three years ago, and every time I pick it up, I get more out of it because I think I'm in a different place. And my yeah. level of awareness is, is raised a little bit. And it's like, oh, okay, now I understand what she was saying there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other people have told me the same thing. I should, I guess I should reread it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I, it's, 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 it's actually, it's, it's really incredible book. So, Thank um, you. and I know you're not really into uh, public speaking. So I really appreciate you doing this. I, you know, I, I really wanted to get you on. I, for, when the first time I heard you, I didn't even have a podcast at the time. I like, someday I'd like to talk with her. So I'm, you know, this is a this is a dream come true for me. Oh, good. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Brian. It's really fun. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Good night. Um, goodbye, everybody. That's another episode of Brief to Growth. I'm your host, Brian Smith. And this is Natalie Sudman. Make sure you go out and get her book. Have a good evening. Hey, thanks for watching. Before you leave, 
I'd like to just remind you, you can always find me at www.grieftogrowth.com. That's grief, numeral two, growth.com. And you can schedule a free half hour consultation if you'd like. Also, before you leave, please click on the like button here. Click on subscribe and click on the bell. By clicking like, YouTube will show the video to more people. And by subscribing and clicking the bell, you'll be notified when I release new material. Thanks for watching and have a great day.